much for coming out today. My name is Jason Booms. I'm with Karma. It's a media intelligence company based in Washington, D.C., at least in North America. We are a global company. And I just want to thank you for coming out to uh, participate in today's forum. Uh, the topic, of course, is climate change renewables, uh, covering uh, public policy as well as business implications, and most importantly, taking a look at media coverage to see uh, what the media is talking about, what the key trends are, and uh, ways in which uh, we can uh, use this information um, to uh, make operational changes as well as uh, communication strategy changes. Uh, just a few quick things before we, uh, we begin. Uh, I just want to say that uh, these are part of a series of panels that uh, Karma puts together. Uh, the idea here being we uh, create communities of interest where we can share ideas related to industries and sector, uh, sectors of importance to us, foster conversations, and, uh, and share some research insights with folks. As far as today is concerned, what we're going to do is essentially, it's a couple of different parts. Uh, first, I'll be presenting a, a brand new global research study, a media research analysis we did taking a look at climate change and renewables. Uh, I promise, because it's a PowerPoint, I'll try to keep it limited to about 10 minutes. It's about 20 slides. Uh, and then I'll be shifting over to the role of moderator, where I will be uh, speaking with my esteemed panelists that were uh, so kind as to join us today, each one having a very a distinct point of view and background, which I think will foster a very lively and informative conversation. And then following that, uh, we are going to allow some time at the very end uh, for some Q&A uh, for whoever has any questions. Uh, we would only ask at that point, uh, if you please, because we are videotaping this, if you could uh, please wait for the microphone to be brought around to you. Uh, that would make the clarity of the conversation much easier for all concerned. Uh, all right, with that said, uh, and each of the panelists are going to introduce themselves uh, through a longer form introduction. But uh, I'll just do a very brief one. Uh, again, uh, Jason Booms, uh, Managing Director of Karma North America. Uh, starting uh, to my immediate left and uh, moving down the table, we have Dee Bambani, who is the Director of Communications with the U.S. Energy Association. We have next to her, Brian Wolf, who is the Executive Vice President, Public Policy and External Affairs at Edison Electric Institute, known to many as EEI. Next to him, we have Roger Ballantyne, who's the president of Green Strategies Incorporated, venture partner at Arborview Capital LLC. Next to him, we have Kerry Funk, the associate director, research on science and society, the Pew Research Center. And at the end of the table, we have Evan Lehman, the deputy editor at E&E &E News, Climate Wire. So again, thank you all so much for coming out today. And I would be remiss if I didn't also acknowledge my colleagues in the audience who uh, have been instrumental in putting this event together. And, uh, so let me just uh, briefly acknowledge them before we go on to the presentation itself. Uh, joining us is our CEO of North America, standing in the back, uh, Chip Griffin. Uh, next to Chip is Tom Kowalski, our Director of Partnership Analysis based in New York. Daniel Wolf, a uh, researcher of ours in the DC office, uh, standing next to the sign. And still out front is another researcher of ours, Kristen Ellis, who is also based in the Washington DC office. And uh, last but certainly not least, uh, the man who helped uh, put this event together logistically uh, is Gordon Platt with Got the Media, uh, standing in the back of the room with the call. All right, that's it. Um, as far as the media analysis itself, it really is designed to cover a, a few elements. Uh, it is, as I mentioned, a global study. Really, its focus is on what's the media saying, uh, and to a certain extent, what appeals to them, what stories are they more likely to cover, what language is more likely to resonate with the media, uh, both on the topics of client change as is renewables in general, and how can we t use this information to make uh, uh, changes again in terms of our business strategy or in terms of our communications strategy. Energy is such a fascinating topic insofar as it not only is important in and of itself, and we obviously decided to pick climate change and renewables, uh, number one, of their overall salience, of their topicality, uh, their key uh, economic drivers, and they impact so much else that relates to other industries. 
Uh, for example, climate change has a decided impact on agriculture, on where and how crops are grown. Uh, for example, will Bordeaux wines in 20 years be coming more from Wales or Ireland, for example? Uh, transportation, uh, how objects, how goods and services are actually brought to people and the costs involved there using different types of energy sources. National defense, we can take a look at the impact of climate change on that, just based on uh, the flooding which is going on in Norfolk, which as we know has a high concentration of U.S. military uh, resources there. Finance, risk mitigation, insurance, all of these things are touched by climate change and by renewables, and that's such a very important part of the conversation. We wanted to do a deep dive to see exactly what the media has been saying about it. Just in terms of intersectionality for a moment, in taking a look at power generation in a relatively recent year, um, as it, power may make the world go around, but the biggest contributor to emissions in the U.S. by sector uh, is on electricity. So we can see the direct correlation which exists between uh, renewables, different types of energy sources, and its impact uh, on the potential impact on climate change via emissions. Uh, followed, of course, by transportation, industry, commercial, residential, and agriculture as sectors which are significant uh, contributors to emissions in the United States. However, uh, power consumption patterns are evolving, and we're seeing this uh, in, well, across the world. We're seeing this in very large markets. Uh, in fact, uh, there have been very recent articles actually following our media analysis that we conducted uh, from very different publications. Uh, on India, on China, on the different sources uh, they're using for power generation, for their power supply. Uh, in terms of tonality, which were frankly quite similar, uh, despite the fact they're dealing with publications as varied as The Economist uh, versus The Nation, nonetheless expressing uh, the renewables conversation in a very similar sort of way. That said, we're still seeing questions in the media, and this goes to a point I'm sure we'll be discussing very soon. Is the media getting the story right? Uh, are they missing parts to the story? Uh, where are the blind spots, if you will? Um, and are they asking the right questions? Uh, for example, we see many conversations as they pertain to uh, predictability, to resilience, to sustainability, as being commonly raised uh, throughout the media analysis we've conducted that spans the past 14 months. So we come up with a list of key questions. When it comes to climate change renewables, how is the media discussing the two in conjunction? What's the relationship they have? How do they associate one with the other? And how can businesses or NGOs, or other organizations use this to help inform and enhance their communication strategies? From a nation state perspective, we can say, we took a look at who's active in this debate, who is a bit more of a reticent partner, uh, and perhaps why. Uh, the third topic is always fun. Uh, essentially, this question asks, are, are we hurtling to a dead planet sooner than later? And if so, how quickly? Uh, everyone, coffee, coffee's okay? Coffee, bagels, okay. Uh, so, beyond that uh, more dire uh, a sense of, of the impact of climate change, um, what role can renewables play in terms of being a positive uh, solution to dealing with some of our energy issues? Uh, climate change mitigation strategies. Is the media playing favorites? Um, sounds a bit of a loaded term, but uh, nonetheless, uh, are they seeming to extol certain solutions over other solutions, and how can we use that information? Uh, from a public policy perspective, what are their words and what are their deeds? Obviously, we've seen, seen very shifting uh, regime changes, particularly in a number of uh, Western industrialized nations over the past year, and, and what does that bode for the future? And I think we have some preliminary answers based on the data that we were able to perform uh, over the past uh, several months. Uh, businesses, what are they doing to deal with climate change and renewables? Uh, both by sector as well as by individual companies. What steps are they taking? What should they be taking? And how can they take steps that improve their reputational capital? And finally, again, take into account the existing lay of the land. How can they use the information they're garnering from media sources to come up with the most informed strategies possible? A quick note on methodology uh, before I go on to the substance of this. Again, this uh, analysis we performed was truly global in nature. We took a look at 60 media titles, uh, no trade publications. These tended to be mass consumer uh, audience uh, oriented publications. The uh, criteria for inclusion were articles that included both the terms climate change as well as renewables. 
And the span of this was over a 14 month period beginning in January of 2016, running through the end of February 2017. Uh, you will notice some interesting trends that took place over the course of that time. Uh, some rather disruptive elements, uh, perhaps, particularly in uh, the United States, but not limited to the United States, that we believe had a profound impact on the media coverage of both topics. Um, one encouraging note, in terms of uh, things that have persisted, uh, while alternative media, uh, one could get into the, the question of fake news here as well, um, or um, non-traditional media sources, Infowars, for example, uh, they may have certain uh, and other certain voices in public life and in the private sector that may have a distinct perspective on, uh, on, on climate change. Nonetheless, the vast majority of traditional media, print media in particular, uh, fundamentally accepts uh, the reality uh, of climate change. Uh, some had a more neutral posture insofar as they didn't directly address the issue of, of climate uh, change being real or denial, or they presented more of a balanced argument in terms of looking at uh, the arguments being made on this issue. And only a handful really got into the realm of uh, advancing or advocating for uh, something that could be perceived as being uh, a line of argumentation that favored uh, climate change denial. One thing that's very important to note, uh, when we take a look longitudinally over the last 14 months has been the changes in how media coverage has impacted both uh, climate change and renewables. Uh, if you take a look at the uh, orange line in particular, that's the renewable energy. Black is climate change. And this is how the tonality has shifted over that period of time. And for this, we use karma's favorability scale. Very intuitive, 0 to 100. 100 is extremely positive coverage. 0 is extremely negative coverage. 50 is a true neutral point. So for the most part, you're seeing scores upper 50s to around 60, which generally speaking goes into the somewhat favorable, uh, almost near stronger favorable category of coverage. Uh, you'll notice it was fairly consistent across the board for renewables with a couple of slight dips. And again, this is for the entire uh, global media population that we looked at. Uh, we saw more volatility in the climate change area. Obviously, the two terms uh, one carries a little bit more of an edge to it uh, from a partisan perspective. Uh, renewables uh, plays better in, in, in multiple fields, one might say. And we saw two significant dips on climate change over the course of the past 14 months. Uh, one that took place uh, during the height of the uh, Republican primary nomination process. And it took a, another hit uh, in the month following the election of Donald Trump. Uh, those events are correlated. Uh, this has to do largely with the uncertainty uh, facing the potential future of public policy decisions as they relate to climate change, and thus we saw the diminution in the, in the favorability numbers uh, for climate change in those two specific spots. <coughs> On the renewable side, the story is actually uh, quite positive overall. We took a look at volume of stories uh, and, uh, and taking a look at uh, certain uh, key attributes and to see how renewables fared across them. On the jobs economy front, uh, we see uh, more articles that hold the position that renewables will bring new jobs. Uh, we see positive business news insofar as renewables have shown marked growth. And uh, by about a 20 to 1 ratio, uh, we see renewables as the key to fighting climate change over a handful that believe it's a distraction uh, from addressing climate change. And also we see more coverage along the lines of renewables becoming increasingly competitive with fossil fuels. The only area where renewables do not fare as well on these particular metrics is the predictability measure. Obviously predictability is very important. Businesses prefer predictability for planning purposes. Uh, and consumers also very much prefer to have a predictable energy source. I've conducted a number of focus groups for utilities over the years. Uh, and I can tell you every single time the question is asked, What's the most important opinion driver for you in determining whether or not your utility is doing a good job? Invariably, it comes down to some version of when I hit the switch, the light comes on. So it's very much a predictability argument where renewables could stand uh, a bit of uh, room to grow. Uh, very quickly, I just want to take a look at some of our global results that we pulled in here in terms of the outlook 
on renewables and on, on climate change. A great deal of similarity uh, between uh, in several Western uh, industrialized nations, US, Germany, US, Canada, as far as heavy volume, uh, the media is definitely covering these topics. Uh, and by and large, we're seeing similar favorability scores uh, as it pertains to climate change and favorability. Uh, the Guardian, of course, uh, driving a lot of significant coverage uh, out of the UK. We'll talk more about that shortly. Uh, we are seeing significantly less uh, engagement as far as news coverage is concerned in, uh, in the Middle East, uh, in Russia. However, we are seeing a positive outlook as far as the future of renewables, the tonality of the coverage does tend to be more favorable in places uh, such as India, such as China, uh, such as the UAE, and uh, such as Saudi Arabia. It is, of course, I think noteworthy to point out, even though this is a, a US audience, we have a lot of folks here with international interests, that despite the fact of uh, COP21 and a very much of a focus on uh, sustainability and innovation, that there is decidedly less coverage going on in France than one might expect, uh, as well as heightened skepticism regarding the tonality of climate change uh, in, the, in the French media markets. Uh, in terms of what really interests the media, uh, again, bearing in mind that all these stories included both uh, climate change as well as renewables, uh, what we saw really was a focus on an emphasis on climate change, where the article was mostly about that topic. Uh, a quarter of the case it was mixed, and only about 25, 27% of the time, the article was mainly about renewables. So this may be an important messaging consideration uh, when, when approaching the media and thinking about the things they are more likely to write about. Uh, and even though renewables don't receive the same level of prominence that climate change does, nonetheless, we are seeing greater favorability attached to the renewable story. In terms of what the media is talking about, it's largely on regulatory issues, uh, very much dominating the, the stories we saw globally. If you combine regulation and politics into one category, 54% of all stories dealt with one of those two topics. Uh, one thing that's worth noting on the slide as well is business strategy. Again, proactive opportunities for companies to improve their uh, reputational capital. Uh, we're seeing a favorability rating of 61%, so clearly there, there, there is an interest, uh, a hunger, and, and a willingness uh, to cover such stories about business strategies on climate change and renewables in a favorable manner. Uh, shifting from business, well, again, going back to here, people are talking regulation, they're talking politics. What's the hindrance to uh, renewables? It's, it's, pol it's public policy makers, it's politics. Uh, if you take a look at the greatest obstacles, uh, four, three of the top four, and arguably the fourth, have to do with uh, policy making decisions that uh, serve as a hindrance to the development of renewables, uh, government policy in general, uh, tax subsidies uh, for various industries specifically, regulation and pricing, of course, which partially bakes in any costs associated with, uh, with, with government. So again, uh, public policymakers at the present moment aren't ideally uh, situated uh, in some ways to tell the renewable story as effectively as they could, which does create opportunities for NGOs, for businesses, and for other players in the space. In terms of who is talking about uh, climate change and renewables, uh, as you see from the pie chart here, uh, the most frequently cited sources tend to be NGOs, academics, uh, energy industry folks. US government ranks first in terms of being sourced. However, again, I would like to point out uh, that uh, this span the period of January 2016 to February 2017, we now have a, a different administration. So we may expect to see different uh, numbers or engagement levels in terms of talking about these issues. And I think we can, be confident that we can see different content as far as what precisely the US government will be saying when talking about these issues. And surprisingly, a fair amount of invisibility uh, in a number of markets, the EU, France, in terms of they, uh, those sources uh, appearing prominently in media outlets talking about their story on renewables and climate change. Uh, one thing that was striking as we went through the results was the the lack of specific company attachment to stories pertaining to renewables and climate change. 73% cited no company, 27% cited a specific company. Again, revealing opportunities for companies to attach themselves to their initiatives on climate change, on renewables, and to advance that narrative as a way of uh, talking about a solutions focus 
uh, a forward-looking, innovative focus that they're actually doing something larger uh, than their uh, specific business practices. Uh, coverage of business is, is largely in terms of volume in what's considered to be challenging sectors, oil and gas, coal, automotive, uh, which perhaps is no surprise given the fact that there's many emissions conversations that can take place in those, in those particular sectors. But we are seeing volume popping up in other <coughs> sectors as well, uh, electric vehicles, utilities. And again, this is an unfavorability list, so you're seeing some highly negative or critical stories uh, in oil, oil and gas, in coal, in automotive. Uh, where there's opportunities for improvement, but decidedly uh, far fewer negative stories in some of these other industries indicating uh, a certain receptiveness by the media to, to, uh, to cover these things in a, in a manner which generates positive press. Um, again, just very quickly, um, there are opportunities uh, to talk about some very specific uh, themes, uh, but they aren't necessarily being attached to specific businesses, commercial applications technology, solar panels, electric vehicles, innovation. These are all topics where they're discussed broadly, but uh, not owned to the extent that they could be in terms of uh, incorporating a larger corporate narrative. Uh, I was a bit reluctant to use the term woefully here. I wanted to go with relatively, but then again, I took a look at the volumes and I guess woefully actually fits. Uh, there wasn't that much coverage as far as some very specific companies is concerned in terms of their talking about their uh, climate change or renewable strategies. However, many of those who are advancing those narratives are meeting with some success in getting favorable coverage. This is particularly true with, uh, with Shell, uh, with Total, with favorability ratings uh, north of 60%, uh, and with Tesla at around 65, 70% mark. That's a, so those are, those are fairly positive ratings in terms of getting uh, generally favorable coverage in those media outlets. So what does this all mean? And let me just do a quick version of this. There we go, okay. Um, so climate change, again, by and large, is driving interest. Renewables, the story is there, but it is, based on our research, less likely to be a prominent news story compared to ones that focus on climate change. Can anyone read that? Uh, do that. Uh, the overwhelming profile of both themes uh, tend to deal with regulatory issues, uh, government obstacles, uh, and uh, challenges created by ever-shifting regulatory regimes. Uh, governments, insofar as they're talking about this outside of the United States, aren't being as proactive in terms of uh, advancing their narrative and how they are addressing certain issues. Uh, however, uh, what we see from a national perspective as well as from a sector perspective, there's a number of optimistic themes, a number of positive stories that are coming out there. Uh, business has been reluctant to engage uh, which perhaps may be erring on the side of caution a little bit too much, having seen what's gone on in certain sectors. Uh, but nonetheless, there are positive stories that can be told and are willing to be told. However, we can talk about how the media covers that momentarily. Um, but even companies like Shell and Total are beginning to engage and their efforts are being well received. Uh, technologies and solutions, more than challenges, are opportunities to advance a positive narrative. And obviously, as we enter what is arguably more of a, a populist sentiment uh, or populist era where anything big uh, receives a certain amount of skepticism, uh, there are opportunities nonetheless for businesses to really take the lead in this debate, to talk about their innovations, their solutions, and uh, in order to tell a narrative that, uh, that, that wins over multiple stakeholders and quite frankly can spur as um, a means to enable the government uh, to, uh, to take action in these specific issues, understanding that uh, government many times is necessary to be a partner uh, in order to help uh, businesses uh, well, conduct their business. So with that, I would like now to turn the discussion uh, over to the panel so we can talk about uh, uh, this and more importantly, much broader themes uh, related to climate change and renewables. So with that, I'd like to open up the conversation. Well, first of all, if everyone can give a, a brief uh, bio of themselves, and then we can uh, go into some specific questions. Do you want to start? Sure. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Uh, my name is Deepka Bambani. I'm the Director of Communications for the United States Energy Association. Um, just a little background, we do two major things. We expand energy infrastructure in developing countries with USAID, but we're also an advisory. We represent 152 energy companies 
um, across the spectrum. EEI, uh, Brian's company, Brian's association is one of those. Um, I am the first director of communications we've had, and before that I was uh, a reporter. So I was on the front lines with, with some of you covering this very issue. Thanks. Hi, uh, again, thank you, Jason. Thank you all for being here. I'm Brian Wolf. Uh, I'm ex Executive Vice President at Edison Electric Institute. Uh, we represent the investor-owned uh, utility sector, uh, which is about 70% of all uh, domestic customers in the United States. Um, I think that uh, I'll, I'll save the rest for our conversation. Um, but, you know, I'd like to talk about, and I hope we can, a little bit more about what we can do to partner with and talk more about what we can collectively do together because I, I really think it's never been a more important time to talk about uh, A, our commitment to renewables and A, B, our responsibility to climate change. Uh, good morning, I'm Roger Ballantyne and um, I run a consulting firm called Green Strategies uh, and <clears throat> we really uh, spend virtually all our time uh, on these very issues. Uh, our clients are either uh, large corporations from various sectors who uh, want to understand the competitive advantage that can be gained by undertaking cutting edge sustainability strategies informed by uh, the changes and dynamics that are happening in the marketplace, particularly in the energy marketplace. Uh, we also advise companies that are direct participants um, in the energy marketplace to help them understand, anticipate, and, and profit from uh, the incredible pace of change is happening in the electricity sector with our view that at, at the end of the day, those who are offering smarter, cleaner uh, alternatives, uh, products and services are, are going to succeed and that is our goal to help them uh, do that. Uh, and then uh, I also uh, uh, am with a private equity firm, we invest in the space uh, and um, and I also run the Aspen Institute's Clean Energy Innovation Program, which just gives me a chance to spend a lot of time uh, following and thinking about uh, these issues, and love to have the chance like this to talk about them as well. Thank you. Uh, I'm Carrie Funk from the Pew Research Center. So I'm our lead researcher on uh, the role of science in society, how, mostly how the general public thinks about science issues, including climate change and energy issues. Uh, we do a lot of a lot of public opinion research, both in the U.S. and internationally. So we'll talk a little bit about what the public thinks about these issues and how this works. And I'm Evan Lehman. I'm the White House correspondent for E and E News, which is Environment and Energy News, and um, I'm the deputy editor for Climate Wire. Thank you. Uh, normally at this point, as a moderator, I would, I would segue into a, a gentle conversation, but let's just start off right off the bat. Let's talk about the new administration. Um, how is the new administration changing, if at all, uh, how we talk about energy issues, about climate change, about renewables? Anyone? <laughs> Who wants to go first? All right. um, first. Because that, that prompts me to react to something you said earlier, uh, Jason, that my, uh, which resulted in my fear of impending climate change uh, to be ratcheted up significantly, and that's that I'll, I'll someday be buying my wine from Wales instead of France. <laughs> um, terrified by that prospect. Uh, so I'll try. Um, there, there's a lot of uh, pretty uh, negative things I could I could say that I think are fair about uh, this administration, but l let me try to find a positive in terms of media. Uh, in terms of what this administration is doing. Um, it's focused a lot of attention on the issue of the science of climate change, uh, just through the um, largely contrarian uh, actions and, and words of some in the administration. Uh, and I think from, uh, and I, I'm not suggesting that any of that is a strategy of this administration, I think it is just what many of them actually believe. As a political strategy, I think it's a disaster for them because it puts the debate on the absolute weakest um, part of an argument for anyone who wants to argue against taking action to address climate change, and that is the science. Uh, they'd be much better off talking about various policies of the previous administration or otherwise that they think are unfair or unwise or weren't, weren't uh, 
uh, correctly designed, but by, by creating more media attention around the issue of the science of climate change, I think they're actually doing those of us who want to see something happen uh, in response to climate change a favor. Evan, I think you're about to say. Yeah, I, I would agree with, with Roger. I think that um, the way this administration has come out of the gate um, on climate change, they've drawn a lot of attention uh, to the science and also to the policies. Um, you know, this goes back to the campaign where, um, you know, where, where Trump, as we all know, has called it a hoax. He's, he's, he's uh, used other words uh, that I almost said now, but won't um, to describe it. And um, so, you, you know, I mean, it's, it's uh, from a journalist's perspective, it's really interesting to have an administration that, for the first time since I've been covering this, um, and um, and it goes back to the end of the Bush era, um, you know, sort of proudly uh, states that climate change isn't a problem and. And, um, and talks about it through the policy lens as, um, as, if, uh, as if it's not a problem. Um, and I think that generates, that's gonna generate a lot of attention through the media, um, perhaps, more, perhaps more than Obama was ever able to by you know, sort of talking about it in friendly tones. Well, I'm gonna go just a little bit more. Um, I, I think that A, there's a big disadvantage for all of us being inside the Beltway. Um, because I think the truth, and Roger and I were having that conversation earlier, is what's really going on around the country. You know, I don't really think that renewables, quite frankly, or climate is a D or an R issue. Um, what I do think is that the reality is, whether it be low natural gas prices, whether it be uh, the current economics of renewables, you know, things are moving in a specific direction, and that's actually what we have to look at. And you know, where we sit, particularly at, at uh, EEI, you know, we're looking at this from a perspective of uh, three things that we outlined, and and these three things were outlined um, prior to any election, uh, which was what were our priorities going to be. Uh, for the future, what were we going to ma make a priority for our industry and a vision for our industry? And those things really centered around, you know, increasingly clean energy, you know, modernizing the grid, you know, whether or not you're, uh, you know, a, a microgrid, a distributed energy resource of any, any type, uh, you have rooftop solar, your still backup is going to be the grid. We still have a responsibility to modernize that grid. And the third thing is customer <coughs> solutions. I think we could all agree that I think that customer uh, expectations have changed dramatically, you know, and they continue to. Uh, whether you're a millennial or whether you're someone that just cares about, and I, I know some colleagues of mine um, from ASAE are in the audience too, and, and uh, Alliance to Save Energy, um, you have to really be able to look at what people are thinking about with regards to. Uh, their choices that they're making. So I think there's a reality outside of all this that is clearly not around, you know, the politics of either of these topics. Um, so depending on what the administration does, you know, it, it varies. We all know it varies from one to the other. Uh, sometimes it can be head jerking, um, but we also have to realize what's going out uh, and what's happening in the rest of the country because to me that's reality. I think. Carrie made move first before Brian spoke, so we'll get yeah. to you after. I just wanted to make a, a kind of a bigger point because uh, Karma has done a content analysis of the media related to climate change and renewables, and just want to talk a little bit about what that means and why would we look at that. And you know, one of the things we often try to do is use that as a clue for what the influences are on public opinion, and we also look at it as a. But I, I think I guess related to that is. But we want to keep in mind that public opinion is driven by all sorts of things. You know, this would be one maybe source of information. There's lots of other kinds of ways in which information influences opinion. And there's lots of things that influence media coverage, too. So as you're asking about how does the Trump administration change the conversation about what gets covered in the media, well, so much of media coverage is driven by changes in regulations and policy proposals that it's obvious that we're going to change how you cover media I'm sorry, how you cover these topics in the media because you've got all sorts of new proposals on the table. So 
there's a kind of natural way in which you're going to have spikes in uh, media content as you see coverage uh, often driven by government action. So kind of basic, but I thought you would, you would want to expand on that. I might take the unpopular opinion here, but I believe this administration is a little misunderstood. Um, one administration defines another. And I agree with Brian and uh, my fellow panelists that the administration probably shouldn't address the science of climate change because we're just getting mired in that discussion and it's not moving the ball forward. Um, when I say the administration is misunderstood, if you look at the n number of regulations that came out, uh, so the Clean Air Act was passed 20 years ago. In three administrations, Bush, Clinton, the two Bush administrations and the Clinton administration, only eight regulations were passed. But by President Obama's administration, eight years, 56 regulations were passed. And I'm not making judgment about whether one was bad and one direction is bad and one direction is good. I'm just saying that by comparison, certainly the Trump administration looks like it's light on or doesn't really value um, the discussion on climate change. So I just, I just wanted to make that point since I wanted to be very specific to your question. Um, and I also believe that there are three camps right now when it comes to climate change. We should just establish a baseline in, our, in my view you have people that believe that climate change is real and that we should do something about it immediately. And then you have on the other end of the spectrum climate deniers, people that don't believe that climate change is occurring and therefore sh we shouldn't do anything at all. But I think by and large, most of the people are in the center, which is yes, the, the climate is, the globe is warming, um, climate change is occurring, but we should take, at, and we should take measured approaches to protect our environment. And I think by and large, most people fall into that central category. And I think a lot of people, I know a lot of people in this administration do fall into that central category. Because right now, the color, of the, the color of the day is green. And I don't just mean environmental green, I mean money green. So you can just follow the money as Roger talks about. So um, I, I completely agree with that last point. Um, but since we're, you know, we're talking about the media, I, I, where people land, and particularly if we think outside the Beltway uh, and outside of the people who read things like Evan's publication, which, is, which I read every single day, uh, and it keeps me tremendously informed. Most people don't. So what are the messages that they're getting? And I think, um, I think, the, I think the media has largely failed uh, here. Um, I think climate change is the single most underreported story in the history of media. Um, so there's that. And then I think to the extent that it is being covered, there's um, uh, particularly en energy, I think it's not covered particularly uh, well, and par partially because it's extremely complex. And I'll point to one thing, you know, Jason, even something you said earlier about, about renewable energy being unpredictable. Renewable energy is not unpredictable. It's entirely predictable. It is intermittent, and that is different. Um, so just when people start thinking about renewable energy is unpredictable, I'm pretty sure it's gonna be dark tonight. Uh, so I, I can predict that. Uh, and you know, beyond that, we have models now where you can predict wind and cloud cover. It is predictable, that's not the issue, but it is intermittent. So does it fit neatly into the grid that we designed starting in 1895 in Chicago with a centralized fossil fuel plant with, with wires and electrons moving in one direction uh, fired by fossil fuel? No, it doesn't. But the question is not, is it, um, can we evolve the system in a way that uses this energy? So if, pe if the media is talking about, well, renewable energy is kind of good, but A, it's expensive, we keep hearing that. That's changing slowly, but the media is behind. Uh, the cost of solar power has, has come down 83% in the last six years. The, co the cost of wind power has come down 66% in the last six years. Now, that's those, personally, if you really want to get geeky, those cost estimates are not fully accurate and all that. But the bottom line is it is, it is not less expensive. It is intermittent. It creates challenges. It is not dispatchable. There are values that other forms of energy have that renewable energy does not have. And that's all fair. But I don't think the media is fully explaining that. If you went to someone and said, hey, I got this source of energy, and guess what? The fuel's free, doesn't, you don't have to pay anything for the fuel and it doesn't pollute, do you like it? The answer's gonna be yes. Um, but I think that 
it applies to, you know, I think nuclear is not being treated fairly in, in the media either. It's not being talked about as a zero emission source as much as it is waste and Three Mile Island and his legacy things. But the media is not keeping up with the science, the trends, and the economics. And then just to reiterate the point Brian made to loop back to on my final point about the Trump administration. I almost don't care what these guys are doing. I mean, t to me, they are they are so out of touch, which which is what's happening in the marketplace, where the capital's flowing, where the innovation's happening, where businesses are investing. Uh, and I don't think they get any of that. Yesterday, and speaking of the media, I don't know how many of you saw a story today about what Walmart, one of my dear clients, announced yesterday. Probably not, because I'm not sure the media got that much of it. A goal of reducing carbon emissions by one billion tons by 2030, a billion tons. And they're, they're doing that because they think for them, their suppliers, they're gonna make money doing this. They're not, they're not doing it because they feel like they need to fulfill the role of Barack Obama in addressing climate change. This administration does not understand the business of this issue at all. Well, I, would, uh, I wanna go back to something Dee said because the, the green issue. Um, you know, my colleague here in the audience, Eric and I spent a lot of time with um, uh, the Risky Business Project and, and really studying that. When you really think about the, the business case for a lot of this, it's exactly what Dee said. It, it really is a green issue, and Roger was right when we talked about uh, the economics of renewables. Uh, I think we have to take that in consideration. You know, I'll acknowledge, you know, we are the incumbent in this space. You know, we have been an industry um, that are, you know, we're being disrupted, we are disrupting. Uh, this has been happening for over 10 years. Um, it is not a very fast, quick turnaround process. Uh, it, is a, it is a long, lengthy process when, if you absolutely understand, uh, uh, taking consideration the regulatory process, 50 different ways uh, around this country, and that's actually what we're gonna see. Um, you know, most of my team now, you know, while we will be paying attention to policymakers on the Hill and what, what Congress is doing in the entire federal landscape, but the majority of what we will be doing is actually out in the states. Um, and, you know, and being the incumbent, I will say this in a, um, a self-deprecating, I hope, way, but the things that you don't know about what we are doing are them actually the most powerful things. Um, because it's actually like Roger said, you know, we are already, according to EIA, you know, our emissions are at 25% below uh, where we were. Um, in 2016, the Clean Power Plan actually was 30% by 2020. We're already like heading in that direction and actually I would say greening in that direction at a much faster pace, you know. And then also at the same time, when I sit down with policymakers and they're like, well, you know, let me get, let me ask you what you think about what we're doing. And I will say, how much, how much solar do you think that we're putting on our systems right now, you know, of the entire solar uh, capacity that's installed? And somebody would look at me and, you know, a, a senator uh, a couple of weeks ago gave me an answer that was very low. And I was like, actually, no, we actually do 64% of all solar in this country, almost 100% of all the wind. So I think that being, you know, from the media point of view, you know, it's, it's, it's not unlike any other industry or any other political issue. We actually, the media actually wants to cover things that are, that not, don't really create debate, they create divide. You know, and actually what I think is that we should be rowing in the same direction, we're, we're wanting, uh, the same things, it may be how we get there might differ a bit. So, I, you know, I think that is where the work lives. Uh, I think that's what we should be focused on, and that's the reality of it, because it's just, e those are the easiest stories to write, by the way. And Gordon and I were actually having a conversation earlier about, you know, I'm a former journalist, I worked at CNN, you know, I, I have to look so closely now at, at content, you know, because I'm like, where is this coming from? You know, because I don't want to sit back and be like, you know, my mother in Arkansas who turns on Fox News and consumes it and then, then regurgitates it like it's fact. You know, I actually want to know what kind of news I'm getting and where it's coming from. And then I have to pay particularly close attention if it's sponsored content. 
You know, if you think about the reasons why newspapers don't exist largely anymore, it's because, guess what, we've had to figure out different revenue streams for how to make money, and that's primarily off of sponsored content, you know, that is biased. So, you know, the awareness of all of this from, we're, we're back to where Roger said we needed to get to the media part of this, you know, we need to be writing about things that are factual, that do pair up and actually create the momentum that we all need to be headed to the future that we want. And, and I think that's really what's missing. Let me just ask then, this is a natural uh, moment for a follow-up since uh, we spent a few minutes on uh, what the media uh, perhaps is uh, a little bit askew on. Um, is there anything that where the media is doing a particularly good job of getting the story right as far as climate change, as far as renewables, uh, anywhere that you feel as though you know, they're really nailing it? I think the trade press is doing really, really well at getting it correct. Um, but they're used to being in the trenches, um, reading things like FERC filings, understanding the building blocks of energy, understanding how energy is produced and delivered, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I, I completely uh, agree, agree with that. And again, I'm calling out e &A, <clears throat> which I just love. Um, I don't like this question because saying nice things isn't as much fun. <laughs> I'm like sorry. Um, but uh, no, I, look, I think that, first of all, the term the media doesn't really work anymore. Um, you know, people at my age think the media, the first thing that pops in their mind is New York Times. Um, you know, does the New York Times do a good job on these issues? I think it does an excellent job on these issues. Does anybody read it? Does it matter? I don't know. Um, but I guess, you know, to maybe be a little bit optimistic, um, in terms of the, 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 the media, you know, when I, um, I was President Clinton's climate change uh, advisor, and when I was leaving the administration uh, in a very frustrating time for this issue, I was, I was often asked, you know, do you think, uh, by people from other countries in this country, do you, do you think America's ever actually going to do something on climate change? And my answer to that question always was, unfortunately, yes. And, what I meant by that was we would, but we would do it after the effects of climate change started to become so clear that we would react, but it would be too late. Um, and, I, and to an extent, that kind of, I, I think, is, follows where the media, I think the media is going to get this issue right. I just wish it had happened a long time ago. Evan, you were leading it. So, uh, you know, I think You're getting lots of props in this fifth thing. <laughs> Well, I, you know, I mean, I work for Climate Wire, so I know we do it right. Um, uh, you know, um, I think the new age of media is going to, um, you know, it's going to tell the story of climate change and renewable, renewable energy and every other topic in a better way because it's going to be more, it's going to be more narrowly focused. There's going to be outlets that specifically focus on all of these issues. Um, and um, so, so for that reason, I think that, you know, the story is going to be told in a more accurate way. You might have to, you know, you might have to, you might have to look for it. It might be, you know, it might be centered toward people that are interested in those issues. Um, it might not be as accessible to the masses. I know that our publication is not. Um, so, you know, and, and then sort of more generally, um, you know, the New York Times and the Washington Post have been uh, increasingly telling the story around climate change. Um, um, and, you know, I've covered the Hill for, I covered the Hill before the White House for a long time, and the difference between the Hill and the White House is really shocking to me when I got into that briefing room in January, in that you know, there are 49 seats in that White House briefing room, and the majority of them are occupied by cable news broadcasters. And, you know, in some ways, I think that it's sort of a mutually affirming relationship between the White House and cable news. Um, you know, you've got cable news that doesn't ask about climate change, and you've got the White House that doesn't talk about it. And, um, you know, so, you know, I. TV does, does not, I think TV has some, some real challenges in covering the White House, or covering climate change, just because, you know, it's a very difficult issue, and it's 
not necessarily told with uh, pictures very well. Well, let me ask you this. As far as, and, and Carrie, I'm kind of looking in your direction. Oh, oh, no. um, regarding educating the public, are there things that the media writ large can be doing that, in your opinion, would do a better job of getting the facts out to the average consumer uh, who, is, who may be, to some extent, concerned about how climate change might impact their lives, their children, their grandchildren's lives. Same thing for renewables. W what do you see as, as the media's role in serving that education, um, in an education uh, sense, with the general population? Well, thank you. I think, uh, you know, on the, I think we need to think about what we want from the media. On the one hand, we're saying the media is multifaceted. On the other hand, what we really want from the media is to um, tell people what to think, which is not going to happen. Um, they, you know, we talk a lot about people being in their media bubbles and really in their neighborhood bubbles that people are living in, um, like-minded communities, and they are paying attention to like-minded media. Um, but, but you're still wishing for a media that would bridge. Um, so what we do is try to meet people with where they're at. And so, yes, these are complex issues, and we don't really expect people to have the same depth as industry experts would on these issues. And we ask them, what do they think about these issues? So a couple of points to keep in mind. One is that when we ask people about different energy sources, um, we get large majorities saying they would favor expanding both wind and solar energy, um, much smaller uh, segments talking about expanding offshore oil drilling or fracking or coal, but those three fossil fuel energies are very strongly divided along political lines, right? So what's, what's interesting is that you don't get a huge divide by politics on wind and solar and a simple kind of question like that. Um, of course, anything related to fossil fuels, you do get a much uh, stronger political divide. And nuclear energy, actually, you get um, a kind of a weaker political divide, and we'll talk about why that's different. Um, but of course, policies are not about these simple choices. They're often complex choices. So the one question we have that gets at some of the, uh, a, a kind of a trade-off, is whether or not people support developing alternative energies versus expanding fossil fuels as their priority, as a priority for the country. Um, and in that case, you get roughly two-thirds of Americans saying that they would, they would prioritize developing alternative energies, multiple kinds. Um, you know, where the difference is, is actually among conservative <coughs> Republicans in particular. Um, I think about, which about about half, roughly, of that group would prioritize expanding fossil fuels. Um, and moderate Republicans, I think they are lining up, uh, at least on the majority side, with Democrats, liberal and moderate Democrats, um, saying that they would prioritize developing alternative energy. So that's a lot of food for thought, that there is an openness there, but there's also this underlying um, often fundamental differences about priorities and orientation towards fossil fuels. And just expanding the, the scope, because I think so far we've been heavily U.S., but not entirely. But let's, let's think globally uh, for a moment. Developments in other countries, India, China, um, how are they changing the way we're talking about climate change, about renewables? Anyone want to start with that? Um, yeah, and let, let me pick a small bone first. Um, so I, I, everything Carrie said makes, makes sense to me, and this is actually relevant to your question, so I will I'll sure. back. But, um, but the, the opinions that people are forming, which do form along partisan lines, which signals to me that there's uh, less than a full degree of, of thinking that goes into it, because if you just kind of know, well, that, that's my team, my team thinks that, you can kind of stop there and go, and go there, and I think there's a lot of that, and that's very, very unfortunate, uh, because I think there's aspects of fossil fuels that should have broad bipartisan support, and, and same with clean energy. So we need to get through all that. But I think the, the bone to pick is, I think these, these places where people are landing on energy are happening in an environment where the media, again, has undercovered the phenomenon of climate change, undercovered the science uh, of climate change, and were that I, looking at the front page of the Post today, the story of Bill Riley and the poster of Bill Riley, and you know, underneath, I'm not going to go any further there, but underneath, uh, you know, on the poster it says, "We report, you decide." Okay, they don't actually do that, but if we did more of that, we're not telling people what to think. We're telling them that a Manhattan-sized chunk of ice just fell off West Antarctica and what that means, and let them figure out. Okay, well, that sounds a 
okay or not. I mean, but it's not even getting covered. So I think so. That's the bone pick. We're not people aren't making these decisions uh, you know, in the right context. I'm sorry. What was your question? Oh, uh, China. Um, uh, again, misreported to underreported. Maybe you know. I, I saw yesterday, and I'm, I'm sure Brian saw this. Maybe you, you, you others, Evan. I'm sure you did too. Twelve members of Congress wrote a letter to uh, the president, twelve Republican members of Congress. You know laying out all the reasons why you should get out of the Paris deal. And one of them was just a complete misstatement of what's happening on energy in China. Um, China's from a horrible baseline, granted from a horrible baseline, they have transformed their energy sector towards clean 10 times more than any other country probably put together. Um, horrible baseline, still a lot of bad stuff, but if you look at the pace of change and, and why they're doing it, and it's not necessarily about climate change, which is fine, I don't care whether um, uh, that there, there is a lot of change. I think you know India is a, a bigger nut, but I think to the extent that China has been brought into this conversation, it's either starting with hoax to, to one extent, to look how dirty and they're going to keep using coal. Sure they are, um, but I think the full reporting of the transition that's happening there has not. Happened. Other thoughts on any global trends, Carrie? Yes. Uh, start the conversation with the public opinion. Uh, this is uh, 2015, I think, so maybe a little bit behind um, what Roger's talking about, but when we did about a 40 country survey on climate issues leading up to the Paris um, Agreement, uh, you know, there are wide differences across the world in terms of how much publics care about the issue of climate change, and regardless of what measure you use, you see that. Um, the U.S. and China tend to stand out as countries where there's relatively less public concern. Um, you know, there is much uh, stronger concern in Latin America overall, on average, especially in Brazil in particular. Uh, much stronger, on average, uh, concern in Sub-Saharan Africa. Another, you know, and then these raise questions about why. Why are these global? Why are there these global differences? And um, and you know, one possibility is that they're seeing the effects of climate change in a different way, depending on where they live, with danger to the Amazon and Burkina Faso and sub-Saharan sub Africa, they're seeing effects. So there are multiple influences on why there's concern and what the media coverage is in these places that I think we should keep in mind. Regarding, and I know we will be getting to a Q and A in about 10, 12 minutes or so, so I, I, I wanna, wrap up with a, a couple of questions um, pertaining to how we talk about these issues. Uh, all of you have been uh, in the industry for a while, but we've been working on it from a, a policy perspective, communications perspective, been covering it uh, as journalists. Um, how is the language around climate change and renewables, how has it been evolving? Where, where is the language headed? Well, I, I'll talk a little bit about that. You know, we took on a project that was really about um, changing the language that we use uh, as industry. Um, I, I think that, and I'm gonna go back to something that, um, that both Carrie and Evan and all, all of us have actually talked about, but particularly the, when you talk about the trade press getting it right, I think that you know, that's not the problem. The problem is, as Roger pointed out, is we have to be able to talk and language that captures hearts and minds that are in the mainstream media, whether that be larger print media or cable news or whatever that is. That's where, again, the work lives because that's what we need to be doing. Um, you know, we took on this project and it was a, a, a larger, um, long term, we've been in it for a couple of years now. Um, but you know, we, we need to be able to communicate to the public what, we, what our plans are. And you can't really do that in language that is centered around commission proceedings and rate cases, and it, it doesn't do anything uh, to, to have the broader public actually understand what you're trying to undertake. Uh, so I do think there's a real responsibility around those issues uh, to, you know, thinking about that language that we're using because it's, you know, the trade press does their part, but then you actually have to put it into consumable form, you know, for maybe a lot of us in the room, or I, if I were polling you, if or Carrie were polling you, for example, we'd call you opinion elites. Uh, but really, the rest of the country, we have to be able to put something in a form uh, that they can easily understand, uh, and then they can go out and be able to parrot that information and that story. 
Do we sort of feel like, and I mean, in my view, regardless of where you stand on the climate change issue, I talked about the three camps, regardless of that, um, we've tried to structure our message in a way that really just looks at the reality of the situation. Wall Street has already seen about nine trillion, trillion with a T, dollars go into the clean energy sector. We're talking about people like Warren Buffett and, and, and uh, Mark Zuckerberg and um, Jeff Bezos all investing in a $1 billion uh, energy fund. I mean, you just have to follow the money to see what is actually happening on the ground. 75% of millennials don't even want to work for a company that doesn't have a CSR program or, some, or something in its mission about protecting the environment. That is the reality of, of what's going on in the energy world. And that's a story that, that hasn't necessarily been told. And that's a story that we're telling. So regard, we don't want to get mired in this debate about is the climate real, is the climate change real, is it not real? Should we, I mean, the reality is things are happening. The clean energy train is here. Um, you know, however you want to jump on it, if you want to jump on it right away, we don't believe that it should be right away. We believe that we should take a measured approach. Um, but, but that's how we're structuring our message. It's that we don't even want to get into that discussion about is climate change real or not. We feel like that's ancient history. What we really want to talk about is what is actually going on now. And that's sort of what we want reporters to, to take note of. Amen. Uh, that, 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 that's exactly right. Um, and uh, you know, credit to Dipka's organization and, and, and a lot of credit to um, Brian and his organization because I think it's been a very underreported story. Brian said it perfectly correctly, which is they are being disrupted. And this industry is being, the electricity industry is being disrupted. Change uh, is hard, but there's the media is kind of, I think, portrayed it more as you're being threatened than disrupted, because those are not the same thing. Um, you can innovate around disruption. Uh, and actually, on the other side, there, there may be even more opportunity, but there certainly is a lot of opportunity. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll plug an article I wrote on my blog, distributediteration.com, on Southern Company, and just saying all the great things that Southern Company is doing in reaction to this innovation uh, to uh, find new ways to make money. Dick is absolutely right. Look at the money here, the amount of money that is being made, that can be made. Like any disruption, there's going to be losers. I mean, if you were a big investor in VCRs, sorry. You know, it, it just, yeah, we, you got disrupted. And, and so there's going to be losers. But making policy and reporting on, on macroeconomic trends uh, needs to focus on the winners as well. And that story is a little harder to report uh, and not quite as politically juicy as, as talking about coal maybe, but um, that story's got to get out there better because I think that's the more relevant story to a lot of people. I definitely wanted to follow up on an issue Brian raised, and uh, forgive me for perhaps ending the panel discussion on a kumbaya moment, uh, but nonetheless, I want to talk about collaboration uh, and just the idea of how can, uh, what are the best opportunities for corporations, for the government, for NGOs, associations, what are some potential areas for successful collaboration in this space? Uh, I, I, first off, there's so many areas, and we don't have the time to go into all of them, but if, if you think about utilities and the transition over the last decade, um, you know, we have quadrupled the amount of technology partnerships, you know, for examples, to innovate, um, as, as Roger was talking about, the disruption, to actually innovate. You know, we look at it as really, you know, innovate or get out of the way, uh, you know, because that's what's really about. And, and I think that when we, when we look at this uh, process of collaboration, you know, we have four times the amount of our companies that are actually have partnerships with Tesla now. Uh, you know, energy storage is a huge part, uh, it's gonna be a huge part of the future uh, in our business. So, you know, we, we, you know, collaboration takes place in a lot of different forms. You know, people wouldn't think that we, you know, we collaborate and try and find ways to be able to look at grid modernization uh, with the solar industry. You know, we work with the Energy Foundation on electric vehicle charging. I mean, there's a lot of collaborations that are 
quite frankly, the media would find not that interesting to report, you know, but I actually find it internally for myself. It's pretty exciting because it's, it's where the change is happening and it's actually, you can see it, it's tangible, it's real. Um, and I think that that's where the movement is. It's about collaboration and how can we get there together. Uh, let me give you one specific, very specific example, um, carbon capture and sequestration. Um, we and Patrick Falwell, my colleague, uh, is here and, and he, he runs a coalition uh, to promote carbon capture and sequestration and in that coalition are three of the four largest coal companies uh, in the country who we work with on a daily basis, uh, all the way to NRDC and the Clean Air Task Force and uh, the AFL-CIO. We, we are all working hand in glove together on that issue. It's a perfect example of where you can collaborate. Any other thoughts on either collaboration operationally or other ways in which these collaborations can be made a bit uh, a bit sexier? For, forgive me for using the term, or a bit more of interest to the media. A any way to, to sort of elevate those sort of collaborations? Yeah, I mean, we should begin by getting rid of the word collaboration, I think. But um, <laughs> uh, uh, um, so success, you know, all right. So, <laughs> so so the media, you know, I don't envision collaborating with. Uh, business to you know to sort of tell those stories or anything like that, but you know certain media outlets like ours you know could could um, could cooperate with you know other media outlets that are more generalized and you know give them a more specialized edge on telling climate related stories and things like that. In fact, we're going to be doing that uh, for a story on North Dakota coal with NPR uh, coming up. So. You know, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I think that, I think there's, I think there's room for those kinds of things to happen too. I, I just wanted to echo uh, Roger's statement. There, there is a lot of collaboration, and I know, Evan, you don't like that word, but the reality is a lot of stories that, I mean, I'll pick up five publications in a day, and depending on where they fall on the spectrum, um, I'll see a different kind of headline when it comes to energy, and I don't want to point fingers or give you the, any like specifics. But the reality is the media is kind of creating this polarization, is kind of creating a little bit of this acrimony that is, are you for fossil fuels or are you for renewables? Which one are you? And I, I, we were up at UN meetings in New York a couple weeks ago and I saw that. It's sort of like, are you with us or are you against us? You can't in some people's eyes, you can't be for fossil fuels and also be for renewables. So it's so refreshing to hear Roger say what he did because, um, you know, we're all for carbon capture and sequestration. Fossil fuels still meet most of the world's energy demand, period. So you have to kind of factor fossil fuels into that equation. So if the fossil fuel industry is moving toward carbon capture and sequestration, um, and we're working with the Department of Energy on that, then, then that story should be reported. Instead of saying, are you for fossils or are you against fossils? I mean, it just shouldn't be this um, polarization, I don't think. With that, I'd like to uh, open it up to questions from the audience. Again, I think we have a microphone out there that uh, we can uh, take around. Okay, the first hand I saw come up was, uh, was in the front here, so Daniel, if you want to come up here. Thank you. I'm Monique Hannes with Advanced Energy Economy, and we represent the full clean tech sector. And I would just like to hear from the panel about what we could do more, sort of taking it back to um, the White House and the Congress to convey the message about this bi huge business opportunity. It's something we've been working on a really long time. And, um, and also, you know, all of us in communications, we, we hear about you got to tell the story. You got to find that story, the person on the ground. But so I'd really like to hear your advice about how we can do a better job getting you the content for those of you in media and for those that we can collaborate with to tell the story. I, I appreciate that. And, you know, we, EEI, we actually work closely with AE. Um, you know, we have, we, when you think about it, all of our work is in the States. I think part of that what we can do is, again, I go inside this bubble because I think we have a huge responsibility to be able to make sure, even though, yes, they represent you know, constituents in their states, they somehow, when it's not a federal issue, you know, it's disengaged from, you know, that conversation and what's going on in the state. So I think really taking 
that from the states, you know, where it used to work the opposite direction. We used to take everything from Washington and deploy it to the states and tell you everybody in the states what to think. I think it now should go the other way around, and I think we should be taking what's happening in the states and educating policymakers in Congress. Hi, my, a great panel, by the way. Um, my name is Peter Crosby. I, um, I work with a company. We translate video into any language. So for you communications people, there might be an opportunity. My question specifically is, Dipka, you gave a, a number, $3.1 trillion, what was the number you gave? Of investment in renewables? Oh, uh, about nine. Nine, yeah. nine trillion dollars. And, and um, uh, Roger, you said you thought that one of the uh, biggest uh, missings was the under-reporting of uh, China's green leadership almost $400 billion of investment before 2020. Is there an opportunity to use China's leadership as leverage to the American public uh, in a competitive sense, in a follow the money sense, in some way that gets people's juices running more so emotionally than you know, the brain science? I'm talking about middle America and, and more people. Thank you. I, I think uh, maybe uh, is, is I think the answer, um, but more more in kind of a corrective, with a corrective objective because I think um, opponents of change, uh, I don't mean climate change, change um, use the China use use a caricature of China to sway opinion against action. Again, you saw with these twelve members of Congress letter they sent yesterday. So to that extent, yeah, I think it would be helpful. Um, the, the China boogeyman issue is, um, has been dramatically uh, reduced by the Paris Agreement. So th those of us who are working on multilateral climate agreements for a number, a number of years, the biggest, biggest problem we always faced was China because they would say, well, China's not part of it. You know, why, why should we do something if China's not committing to doing anything? And that was a tough, tough and fair political issue. We're past that now. China has committed. And now you know, the opponents are kind of reduced to saying, well, their goal is 2030 and ours is 2025, and that's not fair, and you know. But you know, that's not as big a deal. So I think the China boogeyman issue has, has been reduced certainly more reporting on, on what they're doing. And I don't want to overstate it and say that you know, they're, they're the Sierra Club over there, because they're not. Okay, but r relative to you know, where, where they were and, and um, the, again, we report, you decide, actually, like that. Uh, I saw a hand over here. Hi, Vicki Arroyo with the Georgetown Climate Center. Thanks for a great panel. And um, one question that I had is how this message from the electricity sector, which tends to be a positive market message as well as policy message, um, translates to sectors that might be more challenging. For example, the transportation sector, which is the number one source of CO2 emissions now nationally and the number one source of greenhouse gas emissions in many of the states that we deal with at the center, which works primarily with states. And there you're talking about likely some kind of price signal to help drive some people to electric vehicles and even CCS, which has been touted, I mean, I think realistically to really see people invest in that, we need to go back to talking about price signal. So I'm really curious for those of us who've been at this, like me and Roger, for some time, you know, how do we do that? Because we saw what happened with the cap and trade debate at the national level. How do we get back to being able to have an honest discussion about price? Well, let me just go at this. I'm sure Roger has something to say about this uh, as well. But, you know, the, I think I brought this up to you, Jason, on the phone, but the, the 2014 data on here, there's the, the updated data from 2016 actually has the transportation sector did take over the electricity sector uh, with regards to emissions. And I do believe that's why, you know, we feel like that we're kind of connected to both. If you think about it, electricity, uh, certainly from an electric vehicle uh, viewpoint. And I think there's a real responsibility on our industry, you know, to make, make that connection. And uh, so I think that's why we're doing as many partnerships as possible right now to make sure on the state level we can get some of those um, policies right uh, and moving. 
Um, you've got, you know, I won't get into it because it'll be a longer conversation, but you've got a lot of the money that's coming from the VW settlement. You've got, you know, we're, we're putting in billions of investments with regards to uh, electric vehicle infrastructure, uh, as well as the entire electric vehicle infrastructure industry uh, and the EV industry. Uh, now, saying that, you know, there is a little bit of cold water to be able to put on that, too, um, just because of what we're seeing. We've always had that uh, struggle with what was going to be the biggest impediment um, in transportation. And, you know, part of that has always centered around uh, the price of gas, you know, and where that, where that is. Um, so we have, well, we have these pockets in the country, you know, that we're still trying to move. Um, and, and accelerate those and expand those in other parts of the country. I still think we have a lot of work to do there, but uh, you know, the infrastructure side of this is a big part of that. You know, the, the manufacturing side of that uh, is, you know, 10 years ago, uh, we had three models of electric vehicles. Today, we have 24 um, with the new announcement yesterday of the, uh, the VW new model coming out. Um, so I think that there's a lot of consumers like to see choice, right, when they're making something about an electric vehicle purchase. And they also like to see the technology and the battery technology that's evolved from that. Uh, I mean, the new, the new model that VW's put out, I think it's 310 miles on one charge. So, you know, I think that was really the limitations that other industries uh, had uh, trying to throw cold water on it was always about range anxiety, things along that level. And I think that now uh, the manufacturing sector is starting to address those. I just think now we have to get the infrastructure part of it right. Well, I, I'm, I'm glad you, you raised it, Vicki, because um, we, we tend to talk a lot about elect electricity sector, um, which frankly, the, the decarbonizing the electricity sector is actually not that hard compared to, I think, the transportation sector. It, it, this is a tougher nut to crack. There's lots of reasons for that. Different elasticities. Petroleum is damn near the perfect fuel. And if it weren't for the CO2, it is really hard to compete with, with petroleum. Um, it's a sector where um, uh, people have a very personal connection and fundamental change changes the experience of people in many ways for the better. If you've ever driven a Tesla, you're like, I ain't going back. But it's still changed, whereas if my utility, you know, greens and reduces their carbon emissions and I turn on my TV, the picture doesn't look any different. You know, I'm not touching and feeling different kinds of electrons in when I turn on the light or whatever. You know, that, that, that doesn't touch me that way as opposed to walking out and getting in a car. And it's a different kind of car and it fuels a different way and it, has to, it costs me a different amount of money. I need to go to uh, a different kind of station. But we're getting there, and I think the you know the role of the utility sector and finally cross the Venn diagram of these two sectors, which we tend to talk about in the energy together, where they're really not the same; they're different. We now have this this bridge uh, uh, in terms of electric vehicles. Um, remains to be seen whether other solutions will be crowded out by electric vehicles. I think there's a lot of good things uh, to happen there. Um, I actually think. Hydrogen is going to start making a bit of a comeback and then re-enter uh, the conversation. Obviously, there's disruption here. It doesn't have anything to do with climate change like autonomous vehicles. So we're seeing change in this sector at a pace that we haven't in a long time. Most of it's pointed in the direction of decarbonization, uh, but particularly when you're devising policy. This is a, this is a tough, it's a tough nut. We've got to keep talking about it. Do you want to say something? that kudos to the Bush administration for advancing technology for hydrogen vehicles. But this is a story, I find it ironic that there are a lot of environmentalists that are pushing for electric vehicles, but that are pushing the utility sector to reduce emissions. I mean, these electric vehicles are going to require generation. And that generation is probably, if you do it now, is going to be coal or natural gas. And I just, I just want to make that point that these electric vehicles aren't plugging into, you know, wind and solar plants because we're not quite there yet. So just, just, it's just a caution to, to recognize that's where the power is coming from. Okay. Uh, I see a question up front over here. Thank you. Thanks for the panel. This is really interesting. Um, my name is Sarah Grady. I work for the Wilderness Society. We're the um, Premier, the only public lands advocacy organization 
Um, and I do energy and climate communications. Um, and my question um, is related to media coverage of renewable energy and climate change. Um, I agree that the media, besides E&E &E publications, is pretty behind the eight ball on covering these issues in a thorough way. Um, in my research of renewable energy coverage, and I'd also be curious what you think about this, but in my sort of um, benchmarking, I've found that renewable energy is largely covered as a business issue and it is not really covered as a policy issue in any substantive way. And um, I'm just wondering if y'all have any thoughts about how we can change that because you know my job is to reach out to more people. Because my, that's my job, <laughs> is to get coverage of renewable <laughs> energy and climate change policy uh, so that the public knows what we're actually doing related to these things at the national level, especially on public lands. Um, so I'm just wondering, I, I understand that reporters are stretched thin and their beats are very, you know, pretty, pretty broad these days, but I'm just wondering if y'all have any thoughts about how to improve coverage of renewable energy and climate change policy. Thank you. To say whatever, I agree with Roger. I don't know why you want to change that because what what moves markets it's what's going to make news. So I'd ride that wave as long as you can. You know, I mean, basically egg, enter, talk to a reporter and say, look at all this money that's going to clean energy technology. Um, that that's going to drive some of the policy development. Again, going all the way, we come full circle back to the Trump administration. That's what they're going to pay attention to. I agree with you. I mean, you, you want to position it. You want the reporters to care about what you care about. But right now, their editors care about the bottom line, and the bottom line is what moves markets. So I would just try and frame it in that way as much as you possibly can, and then kind of get in your policy ideals underneath that. You know what I mean? If I could just if I could just add something more broadly, um, this goes to Vicky's question too. I mean, you know, part of the problem with messaging around climate solutions these days is um, is sort of the frenetic element of that, right? I mean, you know, back in 2010, you had messaging around cap and trade, and that would have affected, you know, transportation. That would have affected uh, the power sector. It would have affected renewable energy and you could sort of focus your messaging on that one policy. Well now, you know, the uh, uh, price on carbon isn't really something that's talked about. Well, it is to some extent, but not like it was then. So you've got that messaging, you've also got messaging around transportation independently, you've got messaging around the power sector independently, you've got messaging around renewable energy independently. So it just seems to be much more fragmented and a, a much bigger challenge from your perspective, I think, these days. A comment, I guess, related to that, and I, I'm, I, I think we're way better off having renewable energy talked about as a business issue than anything else, but um, it took a long time for us, many of us have been working on this, in this area for a long time, to get it to that point, and it's a huge achievement. Um, I think where, uh, but, but part of the, the media coverage and discussion around renewables, you know, I talked earlier about, you know, this unpredictability thing, which is just, that's not the right way to talk about it. it's intermittency and that is a technology and policy challenge it is not a uh, it's not even really a technology challenge it, it, it's a it's a it's a market design business model problem really more than uh, anything else it's completely completely solvable the but what also happens in discussions about renewables uh, is you hear about renewable energy being put in the bucket of subsidized energy and then there's everything else that's by implication, at least, unsubsidized. And, and that ain't right. It's all subsidized. It, it's all subsidized in some way. So it just, it's, again, re reporters you know, have to work a little harder to actually tell that story in, in a, a way that is accurate and has integrity. It's much easier just to kind of use these terms. So I guess you know, urge the media to work a little harder to understand these issues uh, because that impacts people's <coughs> view. I just wanted to chime in very quickly. I mean, just putting on my political pollster hat that I used to wear for many years, uh, making it as accessible as possible, um, a pocketbook issue, whether from a macro perspective or a micro perspective. Um, pocketbook is policy, pocketbook is economics, and so they have that intersection between the two that makes it a bit difficult to, to bifurcate. 
A um, few more questions. Uh, yes. Hi, M uh, Michael Cullen from uh, Manobi Software Firm that works in agriculture and water use. Um, uh, and I'm from California also. A uh, couple of things. Uh, thanks for a very stimulating panel. Um, on the question of what's happening at the, from the White House or from the administration, um, I, I think one of the sad things is that our leadership in terms of policy around the world is being eroded by the lack of initiative and the, the, the denial of, of what's going on um, in terms of climate change. So I think ceding that <coughs> position that we've had over the last eight years at least is, is really not a good thing. Um, but it's true also, as everybody said on the panel, that things are happening at the local level. In my world, I travel to Africa and the tropics. Climate change is an issue in every single country. Agricultural systems are under huge stress. It's, there's so much unpredictability and increased risk. Uh, products like cocoa, coffee, are gonna be impacted over time. Um, and, and it's a shame that we're ceding that leadership you know, in looking at these issues and working on them. Um, in terms of what I've noticed in California, um, in terms of zero emissions vehicles, in fact, utilities are now thinking about laying out infrastructure for electric vehicles, and they'll be cannibalizing the market for gasoline, actually. So I think impacts like that of, of um, one technology starting to ch shift some of these older businesses, I think is an important thing to cover. Um, I also wonder what the view of the panel would be about the fact that the climate is inexorably changing so drastically <coughs> that we can't even conceive of what the impacts are gonna be, and that's a really part of the, the bigger, bigger picture that the media is really not grappling with. So just a few observations. <laughs> I know we have, I think we have time for just a couple more questions, getting some hand signals in the back. Um, yes. Hi, my name is Marilyn Smith. I spent three years as chief editor at the International Energy Agency. And I'd like to come back to the point that was brought up here and responded to by the panel about let's not try to get the public interested in policy, let's talk about renewables in the business sense. And I think that's actually a huge mistake. I think we need for the public to understand why policy is relevant to them and how it fits into the very complexity of the whole energy transition that's going on. Um, and just quickly, when I was at the IEA, a couple of things I realized. One is they really didn't have any um, specific program to reach out to the public. They were very much interested in talking to the energy sector and to other policy makers and to government and a bit to industry. And I would go to, to dinner parties with my friends and say, wow, we did this really cool publication this week. And they would say to me, why don't we ever hear about those things? Um, and so when I left the, the IEA, I actually have tried to launch a project that I think might be along the lines of what, what Evan is looking at. We call it the Energy Action Project, and what we're trying to do is, with very specific aspects of the energy sector, and we have a very strong focus on energy poverty, we're saying, how can we report on the complexity of this situation in a way that's relevant to the public? And just to give you a quick example, we've launched our first project on people who can no longer afford their energy bills in Europe and North America. We call it cold at home. And what we've done is gone from who suffers from energy poverty? What are their impacts? How does that scale up to impacts to the health system or to social systems? And then how does that, um, have, then we, we, we flip our reporting to the solutions and we look at solutions from technology, <coughs> policy, economics and social, social uh, perspectives. And it's, it's just a completely different model for energy reporting. It's a startup and we're, we're pretty happy with we've gone so, where we've gone so far, but I, I'd be interested to, to hear from you as people who are you know, in the energy sector, is that something that's interesting to you, a completely different way to do energy reporting? Thank you for your question. And actually, I wanna make, uh, I wanna 
make my remarks from before a, a little more clear. You know, Sarah brought the policy issue up initially, and I will say that the policy discussion is absolutely valid. It has gotten us to where we are now. But the policy discussion can only go so far, because right now there's a convergence of media coverage and public opinion. The public opinion about climate change as a major issue has brought us here today. It's brought us all into this room today, where 10 years ago we might not have been talking about this issue. In fact, 10 years ago we certainly wouldn't have been talking about this issue. So the policy issue is part and parcel with the business issue. But what we're saying is, We've reached an impasse on the policy discussion. You have people, it's cre there's so much acrimony between the, the quote unquote climate deniers and the people that believe it's going on. And we're saying if you want to move the ball forward, you're going to have to tell the business story. I, I don't think you can not tell the policy story. I'm just saying that you might want to focus on the business story going forward because we have the policy issue, it's brought us this far. We're all talking about it. Now, but the big question mark is, how are we going to pay for it? Is it going to come at the expense of economic development? Look, India wouldn't even sign a climate change agreement, you know, six, seven, eight years ago. India would not sign it because they have 400 million people without electricity. And the prime minister said, look, we, we can barely get these people on the grid and you want us to cut emissions. We've never been the problem. It's been the industrialized countries. So you ended up with so many pockets of acrimony that it didn't really, it was, we got stuck. We got mired in that discussion. So I think Roger and some of the other panelists are saying, yes, it's part and parcel, but let's, let's, let's talk about where the money is. That's, that's kind of a hot thing to talk about, and it's going to, business reporters will pick up on that, Fox Business will pick up on that, and it, it'll be a much more pervasive issue, and that's going to get us, that's going to get you where you really want to be, I guess. I'll, I'll just expand real quick off of that, because I think you are right, but where it, it originates in policy, right? And then we start having this conversation. But I'm gonna go back to Roger's point about, for example, I mean, I'm not from New York City. This accent is not from New York City, okay? <laughs> I'm from Arkansas, home of Walmart, okay? When, Ar when Walmart made that gigaton uh, commitment on their supply chain, when you look at that and you actually think about those consumers and their customers that will read that and see that commitment and see actually, they, they very clearly spelled it out, those are the very people that we need to educate and convince. I know that firsthand. So I just Walmart's one of our big customers. We're just now coming off of our big key accounts. We have, you know, between Walmart, Google, Oracle, Apple, you name it, you know, we have them in because it's in, along that follow the money spectrum, you know, they're the ones that are actually leading the they're they're almost like first in. Um, as first first movers because they're the ones that are actually moving in the space the fast you know it's 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 accelerated they're making commitments um, you know whether it's a hundred percent by whatever date you know they're out there doing it and it actually is a bottom line business decision uh, but it's followed along the policy spectrum as well so I think they are coexisting but I think instead of the expectation that this might come in the form of a blunt in instrument like policy state by state would be a much slower you know, process uh, from where that comes from. Uh, our panelists have been very generous with their time. I see it is several minutes after 10 o'clock, so I'm gonna take one final question and then we're gonna wrap up uh, the Q&A session uh, with the tie. Thank you. Michael Lustig from S&P Global Market Intelligence, which like Evan's publication is a trade publication, but I feel I have to defend or help out my, my colleagues in, in the mainstream media a little bit. Um, this kind of goes to comments that uh, Sarah from the Wilderness Society made, and Brian, I think what, what EEI is doing out in the States. Um, reporters who you are interacting with out in the States, they're no longer a special, t uh, like a utility specialist. You're, there's no longer some guy who's just covering utilities in a city or, or in a state. The utilities coverage is gonna come through, maybe science, maybe business. Um, so it's really for, for you, you, you folks who want to try, kind of get a message across, and it sounds like, looks like Carrie that you're already doing this. Um, you need to identify who these reporters are and really 
go to them because they're covering six different things at a time and utilities or renewables is just one of them. And they, as someone who once did that, they kind of need the help sometimes to, to get oriented. So it does put a little more onus on you, but if there's a theme that you want to try to come across, that's really the way to do yeah, it. Actually, I'd like to pick off of what Sarah said about that with regards to uh, reporters' priorities and bandwidth. You know, when you think about it, that's absolutely the number one critical issue is, you know, it's, a, it's an incumbent upon us and it's our responsibility to make it a little bit more plug and play, you know, for them. But at the same time, you have to do it from a, a really balanced perspective in the states. And, and that's why it's so important that, you know, when we're interacting with, you know, reporters in the states and everything, we want to also make sure that they're talking to the, you know, other stakeholders. Because, you know, it's not just utilities that are in the business anymore. You know, while, while yes, we were the incumbent, you know, to Roger's point, there's a lot going on out there. And I think that uh, that's where you can get that change dynamic of what's really happening. Uh, and you can get that out uh, to, a, to a customer base and, and educate them in a different way. Great. Well, uh, again, thank you so much to our panel for uh, taking part in today's conversation. Uh, it was fascinating. Thank you for all those who attended on, on behalf of Karma. I hope to see you uh, again at a future event. So thank you so much. Thank you.